Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Armchair ESG with Nate and Yates. I'm Rob Yates, Director of Communications for OWL ESG, and with me is always my partner in crime. Nate Giraro, Director of Product at OWL ESG. How are you doing today, Nate? I'm good. I'm good. We're, uh, we're finally back at it after a few uh, hiccups the last couple of weeks. But yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been a wild few weeks, and not just for us, but for the regulatory landscape. Uh, put an article out last week on this new power plant rule. Have you seen this rule? I have. And funny enough, uh, somebody in our company wrote an article about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It would so. be you. So, yeah. <laughs> so we want to talk about this for our listeners today. Um, before we do, for those who haven't talked about it, you want to give a high-level breakdown of what the rule covers? Yeah, so it, it's a new rule proposed by the EPA and it's targeting you know, the power generation sector. And it's, and it's really the most significant regulatory attempt to curb uh, emissions uh, in the U.S. So, um, you know, the, the EPA says that it will meet the requirements of the Supreme Court's West Virginia versus the EPA, EPA ruling uh, from last year. But, you know, there's, there'll probably be legal, legal challenges in it. But, you know, it, it, it's going to cut what was a six, 617 million metric tons of emissions by 2042, and then an additional 214 to 407 emission, million metric tons, you know, of existing gas fire combustion turbines also by 20, 2042. So it's really targeting the energy sector uh, and curbing uh, GHG emissions. So that's really the high green, green gas house emissions. So that's really the high, you know, 30,000 foot view of the ruling. Um, but, you know, it's pretty interesting. What what are your thoughts about it? So there's a lot to break down. Um, first of all, the rule has been sort of in limbo for about 18 months. It's a massive rule. I think it's 672 pages. I mean, that's going to be wrong, but it's something around there. But it was contingent on this West Virginia ruling, which sort of spelled out what the EPA could and could not do in terms of regulating power plants. So it came out and it goes after fossil fuel power plants. There's, there's five components to the to the rule, if you really look in detail. Um, but what it basically does is limit by 2035 about 90% of emissions currently coming from power plants. And the primary method for doing this is either going to be using hydrogen as a fuel, uh, particularly in conjunction with coal. So this this specifically goes after coal and natural gas. Power plants, believe it or not, we we only get about 3% of our power plant energy from oil-fired plants. It's mostly coal, natural gas, and then hydroelectric, nuclear, and other sources. So this is very much going after large coal plants, large um, natural gas power plants, and it's through this addition of hydrogen as uh, an additional fuel and through carbon capture technology. What's interesting about the rule, it is it is incredibly ambitious. It is a huge amount of reduction in greenhouse gases, but it's relying on technologies that are at best, unproven. They're in their early yeah, stages. So yeah. So you're referring to the carbon capture technology, right? And, and the hydrogen fuel conversion. Yeah. Um, yeah. As of right now, to make, to, to, I guess, retrofit a power plant so that hydro, hydrogen can be used in addition would cause more emissions than just burning the fuel for the same period of time, just burning coal, just burning gas, whatever it may be. Now, the counter argument to that, and I think this is valid, is if you use also sustainable energy to retrofit, to start to, to get the hydrogen, like the preparations ready as a fuel, the technology, sure, then, then the net reduction is significant. Um, we should do a separate episode on solar and wind because there's some significant issues there too. They're not, I, I think calling them green just means no emissions from the source, but there's a lot of emissions installing them. They have huge impacts on wildlife. They're these massive scars on the land. I, I'm personally a huge component of nuclear, but that's a whole separate issue. But yeah. And that, I mean, there's problems with, uh, you know, wind and solar aren't base load energy providers. Right. So that's, that uh, where nuclear and, and coal and, and natural gas are. So that that's a different conversation altogether. But yeah, I, I, I do see your point. Yep. So, but so going along with this, it is it is 
to put it in context, there's two ways to look at it. The rule itself is a drop in the bucket of all greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, power generation is about 26% uh, as of 2022 of U.S. emissions, uh, with the transportation sector being the number one generator of greenhouse gases. It is about 28% of all emissions. This rule would reduce power reduction emissions. I, I think the total is by about 83% roughly. It's a 90% reduction from all the plants covered under the rule. So in terms of the U.S. reduction, it is a huge portion. And even globally, while it, it's a small amount, it is, I think, 3% of all global emissions, which is not a small thing. Now, to be fair, when you look at, for example, China, I mean, they're building coal plants left and right. They're, they're pumping out emissions. When you look at the U.S. military, they're, I think, the second biggest generator of emissions, or the third. It's like China, India, U.S. military. So if, if we really are serious about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, there's a, a much wider net we have to cast, yeah. and we're going to need more innovative solutions. But in terms of directly affecting the net release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, this is significant. Of course, it's not free. <laughs> yeah. So, do we talk about the cost? I mean, what are the estimates of what this is going to cost uh, in order to put this into into so effect? This this is where some of this I, it almost gets silly speculating on the costs. Right now, the EPA estimates the rule at a roughly ten billion dollar direct cost, and a lot of that will be according to the EPA, offset by credits and, you know, other, other support built into the Inflation Reduction Act, which really had very little to do with inflation. It was, it was very much a, a climate-related piece of legislation. But there are a lot of incentives built in for companies and particularly power companies to start to look for ways to reduce emissions and, and leveraging those uh, the cost should be defrayed some, at least in terms of direct cost to the power plants. On the flip side, the EPA argues that the cost savings um, in terms of lives saved, fewer hours spent in the hospital, just fewer illness, general better health is, is approximately $85 billion. I read the analysis on that. Um, I don't know. That's, that's a, they're making a lot of assumptions. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying it's it's tough to incorporate that. We can just say it's really good that people are going to be healthier, that it's going to save some lives and be better for things. It's hard to quantify, I think. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think, you know, of course, you know, back to what we've been saying for the last few episodes is it goes back to, remember, reducing pollution overall, so reducing the, the, the greenhouse emission gas but balancing that out with other sources of power uh, is is critical, right? So, did you hear about the the newest uh, nuclear plant uh, that came online in Georgia, with the the Bogdol V O G T L E nuclear reactor unit three? I've been right? following it a little bit. So, so, things like that are I, I think are positive as well, right? So, as we're trying to reduce you know greenhouse gas emissions with coal, it's nice to see that hey, a reactor is being built you know, on the other side of that, uh, because in, you know, this is going to cost, uh, uh, you know, this, this greenhouse or this, uh, emissions capture technology is going to cost, <laughs> they say it's going to what increase electric bills maybe by 2%, right. Yeah. And natural gas bills by what 9%, I Something think like are the estimates. And so I'm sure, you know, if we could do more to, to make sure that power comes online in other places like nuclear, so that's definitely something. Uh, that we need to talk about, especially you know, one of the things we're we're planning to talk about in the future here is electric vehicles, right? And Absolutely. and plugging those bad boys in, and so you know you have to have power to power the electric vehicle. So it's very interesting uh, this, this ruling. So yeah, um, it, it is to think about there. Yeah. So you mentioned with solar and wind, sort of the unreliability. And I think that's important, especially as you get into electric vehicles. I think famously in California, you know, they they made a big push for electric vehicles. They shut down a bunch of, well, they they decommissioned or stopped relying on the power from nuclear plants. 
And then yeah. they told yeah. people to stop plugging their vehicles in overnight because the power, the grid couldn't handle it. No, yeah. I also think to be fair, this I don't want to sound one-sided, like there's an aging grid. There's a whole lot of efficiency that we could create just by updating and improving the grid. You get much more efficient electric reduction, but these sort of things also require an energy input. There's going to be emissions. Um, I think you and I are totally in sync <laughs> on this podcast that we are selling ourselves short by not involving nuclear as part of the solution is right. completely clean. It is completely reliable. It's, it's yep. magnitudes of 10 safer than oil, gas, natural or coal. But you know, there's a scare factor around it. Um, so instead yep. we install, you know, these wind farms, they're killing dolphins and whales. They're killing birds. They're creating tons of trash. They're decommissioned after eight years because stuff's going wrong. Again, it's not there. There's places where wind is a wonderful solution, but we have to work with what we have. We have to take a look at where there's power needs, where there's availability, where there's sun, where there's wind. Yep. And we have to understand that the whole point, the whole point of ESG is, is really the pro human aspect of the movement. So if people aren't getting power, if they don't have transportation, if we're freezing people out or people are, you know, suffering in the heat, then, then what are we really saving? That's very true. And I, you know, what we're, we've been espousing on this podcast and to do it out ESG is you have to look at it from a realistic uh, scenario. What can we do, right? What are the achievable measures to reduce greenhouse gases and not cause human suffering or human pain or, or, uh, you know, a, a, a slowdown in innovation. And it's, Things like looking at it and not being zero sum about everything, right? And so you, you you cannot be zero sum about reducing GHGs without other proven technologies like nuclear that that have been around for decades and decades and decades, right? That have a bit, you know, you can, you know, people can spin off a lot of scare factors around nuclear, but it is safe, it is reliable, it's proven. This carbon capture is going to take some time. To, to flesh out and to scale in the real world. And does, does that mean we, of course not, we pursue it, but with the realization that you just can't shut down something you don't like, you know, overnight, um, that, 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 that's just not realistic or doable. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, push forward uh, for reducing GHGs, but you have to look at the whole, the whole landscape like we we're talking about. So, you know, that's where I come down on it. Uh, personally is okay great let's you know let's push this let's let's get the capture the carbon capture technology you know uh scaled but in that meantime let's understand that uh we we have to look at other solutions like nuclear um uh, to, to push things forward so um. well that's so coming full circle back to the this epa rule i i certainly want to withhold full judgment until we really see how like you said, zero sum, how limiting it ends up being. But I will acknowledge, admit I'm cautiously optimistic about this one because it doesn't try to impose unrealistic or potentially like negative backfiring sort of um, restrictions. It doesn't say you have to use this type of energy. It says, hey, let's scale up on these things. We're going to give you a timeline to do it. There's a long runway. You have the support to try and build it in. Those are the sorts of positive technology-driven innovations that I think are going to change the world for the better, as opposed to more, like you said, zero-sum, sort of all or nothing, black or white. Here's what you have to do, and we don't care what the cost is, either financially or in terms of human impact. Um, I, I would be interested to see the development over the next seven or eight years in carbon capture technology as the market puts a focus on it and there becomes an incentive for the market to get good at it and get good at it to scale. Yeah. Yep. But I think it's like anything I, I was, uh, it, it, I don't have all the details, but you know, as you read about, you know, in, or the turn of the century or we're, we're using whale oil to light lamps, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we find oil, oil, you know, uh, fossil fuels. And just the transition from whale oil to fossil fuel and how hard that, 
that industry fought and other industries fought for us to move to a better source of energy um, that, you know, killing whales um, in the big blue sea was, you know, was very kosher back then. It, it was like, you didn't think twice about it. And so now as you're, it, wh- whether it's, you know, moving from the horse and buggy to, you know, combustible engine, right? It, it's the internal combustion en- engine vehicles. You're, you're always going to have, you, you always need to push things further than you think you can get just to move it along. But it's not like you can just stop what you have in front of you overnight. That, that's ridiculous. It, it just won't happen. And, 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 and we need to look at what we have in front of us as we push you know, this carbon capture technology and move that forward. So that, that's my take on all of this is, yeah, you know, let's, 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 let's see how this carbon capture technology uh, comes about in the next, like you said, eight to 10 years and then champion what we have already today. And the other, the other interesting thing before we even start looking at 10 years down the road, but this is almost definitely going to be challenged in court. So it'll be interesting to see if it really does stand up to the Supreme court ruling. What I can say, and I'm no legal expert by any stretch of the imagination, but the EPA had a lot of lawyers working on the wording of this to try and make sure that it wasn't going to run afoul of the Supreme court limitations. So this will be an interesting one to watch. Uh, we will be following it too. We'll keep everyone updated. And and as you said earlier, there's there's a bunch of connected things. There's an EPA ruling coming on electric cars, which we want to take a look at soon. Um, there's some more court developments going on. Certainly West Virginia has been involved in multiple things. It's a coal bearing state. There's an industry there. There's an economic impact. And uh, I mean, right down to things like gas stoves, which is, yeah, you're not taking my gas though, but yeah, uh, I, mean, I have one. I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm of the opinion yeah. that that's sort of a silly. Yeah, side. this is where you're going to lose a lot of people along the yeah. way when you go to levels like <laughs> like that. Exactly. I think that's where the adults need to stand up and go. Wait a second, reduce yeah. emissions from coal power plants. Awesome. Take away gas stoves. Really? Yeah. Eh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, we, you know, it's interesting because you know it, we. Uh, GHG uh, emissions is something that we track here at OWL. And I was working with some clients uh, this week and some partners uh, looking at our GHG emissions data and then our GHG intensity data uh, that we track in our um, uh, data. Uh, and so it's just interesting to see the numbers and, and take a look at it and see the trends of, of where that's going. So, um, you know, that's something that we watch very closely here at OWL. And uh, this should be interesting as this ruling, you know, plays out to see, uh, I'm sure there's other data points we'll probably be tracking because of this ruling uh, and see, to see how companies are doing. So, well, That's a good point, Nate. Um, Owl ESG, truly the most accurate and most objective. That's what we collect. Uh, you want the, G, the ESG data, the GHG intensity, all the points, all the emissions from all the corporate data. That's what we got. This is the place to, to come get it. Yeah, I just well, thought I should sorry. plug that in there. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. Um, well, Nate, thank you very much for your time today. Um, until next time, looking forward to it. Thank you all very much for listening. Gates, and I just got to mention, you look sharp today. Next time, I probably try to thank get you, a jacket you. on there. I got to up my uh, my uh, presentation. You're, uh, you're raising the bar there, so that's great. Always, always. All right. Hey, have a wonderful day. You too. Take care, guys.